Hello again. We're in Christianity and the Social Crisis, page 155. Rauschenbusch's new subhead is Hostility to the Empire and its Civilization. In the preceding chapter, we discussed the attitude of primitive Christianity to the empire and the civilization organized in it. We saw that the hope of the Lord's coming necessarily involved the hope that the empire and its social life would come to an end. The feelings, the feelings inherited from Judaism and its apocalyptic literature and the feelings generated by the persecution of the Christians united in creating a clouded atmosphere of fear and distrust through which imperial Rome loomed threatening and detestable. This feeling received a strong moral reinforcement by the awakened Christian conscience, which felt keenly the immorality of heathen society, the, the lasciviousness of its pleasures, the unnaturalness of its ornaments and luxuries, the greed of its traffic, the factiousness and hatred prevalent in private and public life. How could the ideals of life which they carried in their hearts be realized in a world so incompatible with them? How could a social life so fundamentally wrong be reconstructed? Men usually undertake a hopeful reformatory activity only if betterment is somewhere within sight. In some of our cities in which local politics seemed bad beyond remedy, citizens were long in a state of pessimistic lethargy. Socialists are so profoundly convinced of the hopeless and fundamental injustice of the capitalistic system that they will cooperate in no reform which is simply to ameliorate or prolong a system that ought to cease. Similarly, the political and moral outlook of Christians on the world about them was so dark and hopeless that the idea of a moral campaign could hardly have occurred to them, even if it had been permitted and even if their hope of God's intervention had not made their efforts seem useless. This moral outlook received a sinister reinforcement by the religious belief prevailing in early Christianity that the heathen world was under the control of demon powers. This was the common belief of the heathen world itself, only the word demon did not have the exclusively evil significance which it has with us. Their demons were good, bad, or indifferent. The common man believed himself surrounded by them, just as the medieval Christian felt himself protected by ministering angels and saints, or tempted by devils. For their favor, the Roman merchant offered gifts and prayers. Against their anger, or spite, the Greek sailor wore his amulets. From their defilements, men sought cleansing in the ritual of the heathen mysteries and the prevalent oriental cults. For the educated man, with whom the conception of one God had shouldered aside the belief in the ancient gods, it was convenient to think that the traditional gods were real spiritual powers, though of an inferior rank. The Christians simply retained this common belief of the second century, but by a process which has often been repeated in the history of religion, this many-hued world of spirits was suddenly all dyed in uniform black. They were parts of that satanic kingdom which opposes God and his kingdom. They were not figments of the imagination, but real and terrible seducing spirits who had for ages enthralled the world and persuaded men to offer them gifts and sacrifices. Whatever was good in pre-Christian civilization, or whatever was similar in heathen ritual to Christian rites or institutions, was a counterfeit devised in advance by the demons in order to thwart Christianity, which threatened to rob them of their spiritual power. It is necessary to read, on the, read the early church fathers and apologists to realize how fundamental this belief was in their theology and in their interpretation of history and contemporary life. A theology like ours, with no demons in it, would have seemed to Justin Martyr or Cyprian to knock the bottom out of the Christian faith. But if heathen religion was the service of demons, all heathen life was under their control, for all heathen life was woven through with religious acts and ceremonies. Every official act of state, every military ceremony, every public or private festivity was connected with sacrifices, libations, or prayers. No Christian could take, in, take part in them without defiling himself with the deadly sin of idolatry. The only course open to Christians was to diminish 
their points of contact with heathen society and constitute a little social world within the world. Such a mingling in the common life is, as an effort at social reconstruction would involve was quite out of the question. The best social service which the church could render to the heathen world was to counteract and break the power of the demons. This next subhead is the limitations of primitive Christianity and their perpetuation. Uh, some will question immediately though his, uh, his seeming personal doubts about the real existence of the demons and the spirits. So yes, this was very fashionable in the liberal Christianity of 1907 when Rauschenbusch wrote these words. I think demons and the spirit world have come back into fashion in the light of uh, two world wars and the rest of the 20th century's disasters. We'll put a link in here to Justin Martyr, one of the early apologists that Rauschenbusch refers to here, who had a lot to say about all of this and had a lot to say about the, the eschatology of Christianity as a whole. So we'll put in a, a link to something that Martyr, Justin Martyr wrote about the resurrection, the millennium, and the future of literal Jerusalem.